guys, over the past few years, I have had the wonderful privilege of accepting self-taught flutists into my studio. I know that a lot of you guys who are self-taught do your own research and you do a lot of research. So I thought that with this video, I could give a little nod to those of you who are self-taught and to really acknowledge that what you guys are doing is phenomenal. Being self-taught means that you are extremely self-disciplined. And when I say disciplined, I really mean disciplined. So for those of you who are self-taught and have been watching my videos for a while, I just wanted to officially say thank you so much for the honor of using me as one of your resources. So let's get right into five tips I have for those of you who are self-taught. Everything that I say in this video is gonna come straight out of my experience teaching previously self-taught flutists, flutists who taught themselves before they asked me to be their private teacher. Number one is fingerings. There are a lot of fingering charts online, but the confusing part about them is that sometimes there are alternate fingerings. The reason why there are alternate fingerings versus real fingerings is that the so-called real fingerings that are used on the modern flute today tend to be the most in tune out of all of the other alternate fingerings out there for a specific note. Now, why would you ever use an alternate fingering? You actually use it to basically cheat. There are some trills that you just cannot do without cheating the fingering. And in that case, you would use an alternate fingering. Other times, there's a passage that is just going way too fast to use the real fingering, so you would use alternate fingerings. Alternate fingerings can be completely different fingerings, or they can basically be harmonics. If you don't know what harmonics are, there are lots of resources online. Even Wikipedia has a wonderful, very long article about it. And I also talk about it a little bit in my, I believe my Holy Grail method book, which is the Trevor Y video. In this particular video, I'm going to show you guys two alternate fingerings that are confused the most among self-taught flutists. Your F sharps. Your F sharps should be fingered like this. You got one, two, three, thumb on your left hand, and then you have three and pinky. That is actually the so-called real fingering for the F sharp on the modern flute. Now, a lot of people get this confused with the alternate fingering. The alternate fingering, instead of using the third finger on the right hand, they use the second finger on the right hand. You will actually see in fingering charts out there for the F sharp on the flute, they actually list both of these. Now, in classical flute training, when in doubt, you always use the real fingering with the third finger on the right hand. When do you use this second finger fingering? You use it for things like when you trill. If you were to trill from the E to the F sharp using the real fingering, you would end up doing something like this. You see that? You see how clunky that is and how you can't actually go that fast? Well, if you use the alternate fingering, that means that you only have to lift this finger to get to your alternate fingering F sharp. And then you could just trill this key all by itself. It's the difference between going and huge difference, right? Now for B flat. Typically, if you were to learn the flute in band, the B flat that you are taught is fingered like this. So the left hand, has the first finger down, thumb, nothing else, and then the right hand has the first finger down and the pinky. Now, there is actually a cheat key that was designed for the B flat. Now, I gotta turn the flute around so you can see. On the left hand, do you see how there is a little extra key here? Let's investigate what this does. First, let's go back to the first B flat fingering we were talking about. When you use the right hand first finger to press that key down, do you notice? it actually makes this key up here go down, right? You see that? Goes down. Let's not put that key down, but let's put down this random extra thumb key. If you put it down, you'll see it puts down that same key up here. You see that? The key that goes down that actually makes the B a B flat is actually this one. This is the one that is not actually controlled directly by your finger. It's controlled indirectly either by down here or by what we call the thumb B flat. If you were to play a piece that has B flat in the key signature, you can leave your thumb there for most notes. For the highest notes, 
you typically don't leave it down there but definitely you cannot use it for the high G flat a real high G flat would sound like and then with the B flat thumb key it would be see it's a huge difference also Good thing that I use the high G flat as an example. Some people use, similar to the lower octaves, they use the second finger instead. That is also an alternate fingering. So use this one instead, unless you actually have to cheat. Back to the B flat thumb key. Because you can put this down now and make all your Bs B flats, it makes playing in flat key signatures a lot easier. In fact, there was a whole showpiece that was designed to showcase this B flat thumb key. It's the Carnival of Venice that was arranged by Brucialdi. He basically just made the entire piece just to show off the fact that you cannot play it without the B flat thumb key. Number two, learn and memorize all of your scales and arpeggios. Now, if you are very unfamiliar with all of them, start out with only learning one octave of each scale. Now, when I say each scale, I mean all 12 major scales, all 12 natural minor scales, all 12 harmonic minor scales, and all 12 melodic minor scales. If you're having trouble finding the resources online to figure out how these scales are constructed, I actually made a Curious.com course called Music Theory 101. And in one of the lessons, I actually teach you how the scales are constructed. So if you're interested, head on over to curious.com slash just another flutist to check it out. You will have to pay a small subscription fee for it. You can also buy method books that are meant for students who are taking an examination program. So things like the Royal Conservatory of Music, RCM. There are RCM method books. There are ABRSM method books. I forget exactly what ABRSM stands for, but it's basically the equivalent of RCM, but in like England. And I believe it's also used in other European countries and also in Asian countries because I know my mom took ABRSM. You can actually buy those method books and usually they will have like all of the scales in it and you can just practice those and memorize them. Now, why am I telling you to memorize them? It's because it will serve you so freaking well in any repertoire that you learn because you will be able to recognize the scale and then since you've already practiced it and it's already in your muscle memory, there's a lot less that you actually have to practice in your repertoire. Number three, listen to recordings. And when I say listen to recordings, I don't mean just listen to, you know, oh, how pretty and nice it sounds. You actually want to really focus in on different flutists tone production. Each flutist plays their flute differently. I say this in every single one of my Flute Center of New York videos, but it is true. That means that each flutist kind of has their own voice. It's kind of like how none of us have the same exact pitch in our voices. None of us speak the same way. Being a flutist is the same. No one's tone is exactly the same. However, how do we learn to speak, right? Because we learned to speak by copying our parents. Why else do children often sound exactly like their parents? It's because they're copying their parents because their parents are basically their reference, right, for how to speak. So in the same way, you can listen to a bunch of professional flutists playing and listen to their tone and use their tone as a reference for you to develop your own tone. You have to start with a reference though, or else you're starting from nowhere. I would say listen to people like Sir James Galway, Emmanuel Pahood, I really like Sharon Bezaley's tone, Carol Winsank, Jasmine Choi, you know, just all the big greats. Listen to their tone and you'll hear that all of them sound different from each other, but all of them are beautiful too. Try and imitate a bunch of different ones and see what works better for you. You can grab some tonal properties from one flutist and then grab different tonal properties from another flutist and you know kind of like mix and match and make your own tone. Number four, in the same vein as number three, watch lots of videos of professional flutists. Now what are you watching for? You are watching for hand position, posture, embouchure, basically anything physical that has to do with holding up the flute and playing the flute. I spent a long time staring at my friend's right hand posture before I finally figured out why my right hand posture 
was so wonky. I realized after a very long time that my thumb is super short and that's why I need a thumb port to give me extra support. A lot of you have been asking about this in recent videos as well. My thumb is so short that if I put it down here, you see what it does to all of my the rest of my fingers, like see all that tension, right? But if I bring it up here, Ooh, you see how that relaxes, yes? I only found that out from staring at my friend's hands. You can do the same thing by staring at videos of professional flutists playing. So there's plenty of videos online on YouTube of Sir James Galway playing Emmanuel Pahood. Jasmine Choi, Jasmine Choi has so many videos out of her playing. Go and look at them watch them. I would pause the video and just stare at them. I know that sounds kind of creepy, but you learn a lot by just pure observation. And lastly, number five, I want you guys to practice smart. Just because you bash your head against the scales all day, every day, it doesn't mean that those scales are actually gonna get into you. The way that you smart practice is by taking bite-sized pieces. But how do you learn such a huge volume of stuff? You know, like there's so many scales to learn, right? How do you learn all that stuff while still taking bite-sized pieces? I have discovered that the most successful way to get my students to learn a huge volume of technical exercises and repertoire is to get them to rotate through bite-sized pieces. So you spend one practice session on just one little bite-sized piece. Put that off to the side and you do another bite-sized piece in your next practice session. I know it's very tempting to go back and practice the same thing that you did the day before, <laughs> especially if you are this type of super self-disciplined, self-taught person. You want to know that you have perfected it before you keep going. However, that's not actually the best way for your brain to learn things. The best way for your brain to learn things is to kind of learn it and then sleep on it and then kind of jumpstart it with something different. So it has something different to learn, right? And then you sleep on it. Then you jumpstart again with a different thing and then you kind of like sleep on it. And then maybe on the fourth day, you go back to this thing and now you've had all of these days to actually process it through your brain and you'll find that you actually retain what you learn. Hmm. So for example, if you're learning your scales, learn four scales at a time. And by four scales, I literally mean only four scales, okay? So if you're only doing major scales, you would just be doing four major scales. And if you are at the very beginning of learning this, you would only be doing it in one octave. So say you do C major, G major, D major, A major, and that's it. You just do one octave and you just concentrate on perfecting one octave scale of this in this practice session. You put that down, okay? The next day, you do four more scales, but different scales. So let's say you do the flats now. You do F major, B flat major, E flat major, A flat major. One octave, perfect it in that practice session, and then put it down. If you think about it though, if you do four scales on one day, four scales on another day, and you do another four scales on the third day, that means that within three days, you would have learned all of your major scales in one octave. That's actually pretty darn fast. On the fourth day, you come back to the first set of four scales that you learned, and you will find that you will have retained, I would say at least 90 to 95% of what you learned. Maybe you'll trip over a note here and there, but it's not actually a huge deal. All you'll have to do is kind of rework little bits here and there, but you won't feel like you have to learn the whole thing again. I would advise you to do this for all of your music. So this includes etudes, if you're studying any etudes on your own, which a lot of them are for free now on IMSLP. So you can actually look for like Anderson etudes and stuff. They're completely for free now. And they're the exact same edition that I have a copy that I bought. Anyway, split things up by phrases. If you can't really tell where the phrases are, split it up by line. Just do it one line at a time. What you'll find is that you'll have a lot more concentration to really perfect that one phrase and then you move on the next day to another phrase. Say you are playing a piece that's like two pages long. If there's 20 lines per page, if you really go through one line a day, that means that you ha would have pretty much perfected the piece in about a month and 10 days. In terms of learning a piece of repertoire, that is actually really fast. After you spend that like month or so learning the piece of music, then you can go back and polish it 
for the next month or two. Fair warning though, when you are studying in bite-sized pieces, it's going to feel really slow. If you stick with it and you really pay attention to every little thing that you are practicing in that bite-sized piece, you will thank yourself later. It's faster to learn in small pieces than it is to try and shove a whole piece into your brain in one week. And there you have it. Those are my five tips for self-taught flutists. As I continue to gain more experience teaching self-taught flutists, I do plan on making a follow-up video to this if I come up with more tips. But also, if you guys have more questions and more tips, please leave them in the comment section below. I do realize that this video does not cover all of the tips that could be given to self-taught flutists. If you guys like this video, make sure you give me a big thumbs up and hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday. My last video is over there, and if you want to catch me during the week, my social media networks are down there. But otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye. Getting my flute out. I did not properly put this together. <laughs> Makes my all, oops. Uh, and you see how it made, okay. So if you guys like, my stomach is growling so hard right now.